How's it going, everybody? Andrew Zarian here, Wrestling Observer Live. We're here every day, Monday through Friday, 3 p.m. East, and Sundays, 6 p.m. East. Things have fallen apart in the studio as I'm starting the show. I knocked over all my toys on my desk. Everything's falling apart, but holy moly, what a great show I got for you guys today to start off 2022. And man, we started off with a bang. Last night, WWE Day 1, not a pay-per-view anymore, a premium live event. Pay-per-views are, it's a draconian term in the world of media. And uh, I guess moving forward, WWE will be referring to their specials, I guess their pay-per-views, network specials as premium live events. Listen, I get why they're doing it. This is the, this is the direction everybody's headed in media. Old media is not working. You need new terms for everything. So we have that, obviously. Uh, Cody's win. Uh, Cody winning the TNT title on Rampage Christmas edition. I know that we we, we kind of touched on that, but I kind of wanted to talk about the after effect of this a little bit and where that's going. Day one, obviously. Day one fallout. New WWE champion Brock Lesnar. Jeff Jarrett has invaded the Indies. I could not believe what I saw. Jeff Jarrett surprised the GCW audience with, uh, with him showing up. In GCW, what a crazy <laughs> pro wrestling landscape we're in right now, where Jeff Jarrett is in GCW. <laughs> we also have a preview to Wrestle Kingdom. And joining us, special guest Matt Ryan of Catalyst Wrestling, executive producer of Catalyst Wrestling, to discuss the state of the independence, the state of the indies in 2022. Because I feel like, man, if we don't come out of it this year, if the, indep if the indies, the independent companies really don't, Kick it into high gear. Listen, not that they didn't they didn't want to last time, but obviously everything was happening in 2020, 2021. It put a stall, put a, it, it stopped everything in its tracks. But I want to see what the recovery is going to look like for the indies. Because a lot of the key talent that we're seeing on television right now over the last couple of years, guess where they came from? It came from the independents. PWG, Evolve, the list goes on and on. Andrew Wrestling Observer Live. We're gonna. I, I don't know what that was. <laughs> We're gonna take a quick break right after this. We'll be right back. Take care. We're back, everybody. Wrestling Observer Live. Andrew Zarin here. Sunday edition of Wrestling Observer Live. I want to start it off by some of the controversy that surrounded uh, Friday night. Uh, is this this? I was not expecting this on New Year's Eve, especially out of all days. Uh, obviously, Rampage was going on, uh, which we'll talk about. Fantastic main event to Rampage. My God, fantastic main event. But before the show went on, uh, the internet exploded. Uh, Big Swell Big Swell did an interview with Fightful uh, where she discussed AEW, some of, the, some of her struggles there, and also brought up the topic of diversity uh, as, as uh, that, that kind of led her departure and, and went into that. You can see the whole, you can read the whole article on Fightful. I, I don't want to spend too much time on on the entire nitty gritty of it, but Tony Khan responded to it, and I felt that we need to discuss this. Uh, Tony Khan made a response where, uh, kind of defending himself by saying, "Like, look, we're we're pretty diverse as a company. Uh, two executives uh, are are people of color." Uh, he, his words were, two top, the top two AEW execs are brown," uh, and then listed uh, talent that we've seen on TV. Uh, winning their, their matches. TBS title tournament has been very diverse as well. And here's the jab at Big Swole. I let Swole's contract expire as she, as I felt her wrestling wasn't good enough. And this really uh, turned into something huge. Listen, uh, there's no defense. I, I would, would I have left these, would I have met, left this comment? I don't think so. I don't believe I would have, but you also have to look at his point where he's saying, look, look at all the things that we're doing. Look at all these things that are happening behind the scenes. Uh, you know, he took it as he took it as an insult to him. A pretty big insult. Uh, from what I know, he was pretty upset about the comments that were made. And I think things have settled down a little bit here before people start accusing people of racism and everything else. I think things kind of settled down here. Um, it was on Swole's podcast, by the way. Uh, the article was fightful. Just want to put that out there. But... Listen, uh, kudos to Big Swole. Speak your mind. Talk about what's happening in the business. Talk about what's happening in pro wrestling. I think for far too long, uh, regardless of anything, and, and I'm this is not even on the race side, but for, regardless, uh, for far too long, people have felt that they can't speak out about things they're, not, they're unhappy with due to lack of competition, job security, obviously. That plays a huge part. 
I don't think anybody wants to criticize a company that they just left without any options or, or a company that they're in without many options. Obviously, big swole things that there's plenty of options for her, and, and rightfully so. She's I personally, I don't find her to be lackluster in the ring. I don't find her to be a, a bad wrestler. I enjoy her wrestling. Obviously, there's far more that goes into this, right? We only see 240 characters in a tweet. We don't know far beyond that what has happened, if there's been discussions, if there's been something that she's seen that we don't know. You know, before things go crazy, and listen, this is why I always say, it's so difficult to get your point across. Would I have made the point that Tony did? No. But I don't know what's inside his head, and I don't know what he was trying to say. Um, I, I Listen, I, I feel bad for everybody involved. I feel bad that she has to now hear this and deal with it. I feel terrible for Tony that now he's being accused of all these crazy things. Uh, even the people that liked the, the tweet or replied to the tweet or... Uh, it, it just got really nutty. I think we need to kind of relax. 2022, new year. We're starting off something new. Uh, but I felt that I, I should comment on this. We should talk about it a little bit. Uh, it, was, it was wild to see, man. I, I got to tell you, immediately everybody jumped onto it. So listen, we'll see what happens. We'll go from there. But definitely, listen, the argument, should there, is there an issue with diversity? I don't know. I, I'm not one to speak on this, but I think the people that are there are for, far more experienced in the matter and, and and would be able to comment on this way more than just, you know, a talking head somewhere. So, uh, well, obviously we'll find out more that's happening. Last night, we got a pretty solid pay-per-view, man. I, I'm sorry, not a pay-per-view. A premium live event. Premium live event. Last night, WWE Day 1 kicked off the new year. The first show for WWE, first premium live event for WWE. And I got to tell you, in typical WWE fashion... They, were, they, they got hit in every side with issues. So the news broke out that Roman Reigns tested positive for COVID and had to miss the show. So now everybody's scrambling. What's this match going to be? Who's going to face Brock Lesnar in a meaningful way? Who would the possible replacement opponent be? What are they going to do? Turns out they didn't have a replacement opponent for Brock Lesnar. They made it a fatal five-way for the WWE title. You know, the one guy that suffered from all this, poor Seth Rollins. Wasn't this originally a singles match? The guy started off having this world title singles match and turned into a, a five-way. Uh, so they announced that Brock Lesnar would be in this match. Uh, I, listen, man, I got excited for it. I thought it was pretty good. Pre-show, we got Sheamus and Rich Holland defeating Cesaro and Ricochet. Ricochet hit a standing shooting star press that broke Holland's nose early on in the match. It's not good. Especially when it's the opening match and it's early on in the match. Or ever. SmackDown Tag Team Champions. The Usos defeated the New Day to retain the titles in 17 minutes and 2 seconds. We also got Drew McIntyre defeating Madcap Moss in 9 minutes and 41 seconds. You know, I thought everybody looked good in this match. I thought Madcap Moss looked good. I thought Drew looked like Drew. Um, did it go on a little long? Yeah, maybe a little bit, but I wasn't really bothered by it. They did do a, an injury angle here. Backstage, Corbin and Moss pil uh, uh, essentially uh, pilmanized. <laughs> they pilmanized uh, Drew, and Drew's out, but Drew has an injury. So he's being written off to deal with it. And this will play a big part in WrestleMania if he's not ready for WrestleMania. I, I, this, this kind of, he's been working hurt for a while. Um, I, I think he worked the most matches out of anybody. He's been killing it on the uh, on those house shows. He's everywhere. So Drew really became the backbone of of these these live shows that they've been doing. And you know, when you're normally you're that guy that's working every show, this happens. You're gonna get injured, and you're gonna need some time off. This comes at a terrible time because we're going into WrestleMania season. But I'm hoping that this is a quick thing. Raw Tag Team Champions, RK Bro with Migos, my pals, the Migos. Defeated the Street Profits to retain the title 11 minutes, 13 seconds. All right, cool match. Fun match. Enjoyed it. Edge defeated The Miz with Maurice in 20 minutes. Maurice kept interfering. Beth Phoenix came out, chased them away, and this is going to lead into a, a mixed person match. Uh, we kind of saw this happening from the beginning when Maurice got involved in the storyline with The Miz and when The Miz came back. So, all right, I want to see this. Beth Phoenix, they'll have a fantastic, uh, you know, mixed person tag here. Uh, Raw Women's Championship, 
Becky Lynch defeated Liv Morgan to retain the title. 60 minutes, 56 seconds. I thought it was a great showing by Liv. Uh, they've really catapulted her into this main event picture. She's been there for a long time. She looked, she looked fine. She looked great. They did mess up the finish a little bit. So Becky was trying to put her feet on the ropes to cheat, and she was too far from it and went for the pin anyway. And I think I commented, they said something like, oh, she's going, she's, she's going for the rope but didn't need it or something like that. So that kind of, you know, that kind of didn't look good. But it is what it is. 60 minutes, 56 seconds. I think they worked hard there. Uh, Fatal Five Way. Now, this is where things go crazy. I want to, you know, I watched this match live. And I want to say, watching it live, I thought the match was so fast, right? I'm like, man, they made this 20-minute match feel like 10 minutes. It was a sprint from the beginning. Brock, six suplexes to start. Everybody's hitting their finishers. Brock ends up pinning Big E in the middle of the ring. One, two, three, clean finish. Murdered everybody. Re I mean, gr I loved it, but I kept saying, I'm like, man, how, how quick was that match? It felt like it was like that. It was eight minutes. Eight minutes, 19 seconds for the main event. Brock Lesnar, your new WWE World Heavyweight Champion. And this is now leading into a whole bunch of questions, guys. This is where it's going to get interesting because obviously this was not the plan. Uh, the plan was for Biggie to retain the title. There was no, there was no, uh, you know, it wasn't going to be a situation where you were going to have Lashley win or, you know, some, some weird thing. It was going to be Biggie retaining the title. This changed everything. We're going to go into this a little bit more. I want to talk about this and, and, and spend some time on where this is going to go. Because I think a lot of people are going to be interesting. Res Wrestling Observer Live, Andrew Zarian here. We'll be right back after this. Back, everybody. Wrestling Observer Live, Sunday edition. Andrew Zarian here. Man, what a great way to start the year. Great wrestling, a lot of wrestling happening. Uh, I I, I want to kind of touch on a little bit. I want to touch on uh, you know just finishing up what happened last night and where what this could possibly mean with Brock Lesnar now getting the WWE Championship. You know, there's numerous options here. Either they can make this into a quick one, right? Which I don't think they should. If they're gonna uh, listen, I have an idea. I would like to see these titles unified. I I'm not a big fan of two world titles or a unit. Universal. I'm using hand quotes here. People can't watch, see me, but <laughs> a, a big, you know, I, I don't, I don't like two champions like that. One is always secondary. Uh, you know, there's so much confusion that goes on with this. I'm a big fan of one champion. Have one guy be the man, and he's on both shows. You know, why not do it that way? That's my guess. That's where I want to see this go. I'm all for having them unify the titles, do night one of something, and then have the big match at night two. You know, you want to kind of leave a cliffhanger for one. You could do something interesting with that. So many different options here. Uh, I want to talk about that. I want to also talk about Rampage. But before I continue, I want to bring my guest on today. You know, independent wrestling has taken a big hit over the last two years with not being able to run shows. And this is a guy that has not been able to run shows with a lot of people in the buildings. I got Matt Ryan, your executive producer of Catalyst Wrestling. Matt, what's going on, man? Hey, Andrew, thanks for finally having me on the show. As a longtime listener, first time caller, wah, wah, I'm glad to be here. My dog in the background for those watching on Twitch, not as excited, uh, not getting pets right now, but I'm, I'm glad, glad you made the, the bed for me, though. I'm really glad oh, you yeah. put the effort to made the oh, bed no, for the, the Wrestling Observer. I, I would have, but you the just dog was out? like, nope. She just, <laughs> she just flumped on the bed and refused to move for like the past hour. So I'm like, I got to get, I'm got to be on camera. I got to wear a nice shirt. I got to do all these things. I got to make an effort. But as you can see, my dog has refused to allow me to make any sort of effort. It's okay. It's which all right. Which is great. Which Listen, is great we're a big fan of dogs remote. here. We're a big fan of the animals. So it, more than, more than enough of a reason as an excuse. Uh, you know, for people who don't know you, I know you've been around in the Northeast for, God, uh, 10 years now, right? Give or take, yeah. Give or take. Uh, you were part of Hog uh, on their on their commentary team. You've worked in Ring of Honor. You've worked in MLW. So you have some experience, and obviously Catalyst Wrestling, you know, executive yes. producer of that. That's that's no uh, that's no easy task. Running a weekly episodic television show, <laughs> no. uh, not very easy. It, it, 
<laughs> my hair is going consistently grayer since January 1st of 2017 when we announced the company up until five years and a day later. The gray so has just been popping go into this, right? all over my head. I want to go into the independence and everything, but I wanted to get your opinion. Uh, a lot of people are messaging me now. They're like, hey, go into Rampage. And yeah, hell yeah, I'm going to go into Rampage because I got to tell you, I watched it. I watched it live. I thought it was a fantastic show. Uh, very much enjoyed it. And really, the big story of that show really was that street fight. I, what did you think of that match, yeah. the main event? Because I, to me, that was the main event. Like, that was the main event to me. I know Cody, yeah. Cody, you know, Cody and Ethan Page happened, and I thought that was a great match, and I thought Ethan looked great. But that was the main takeaway from the show, other than the Tony Khan stuff that kind of diverted everybody. But what did you think of that? I thought it was a tremendous blow off and a great way to feature all four competitors because we've not really seen that ultra violent side from some of the women in, in that match. Like we didn't see how far Tay Conti and Anna Jay could be pushed. And we saw that and we saw what their limits are. We saw the bunny pull out some of the stuff we might've seen in CZW or prior to her work in impact before coming to AEW and Penelope Ford, she came up from the Northeastern scene. She grew up at CZW shows on the CZW roster. So she is accustomed to this and allowing all four of them to just go all out on national television on the first, on the last show of 2021. I really liked it. I thought it was a great blow-off match. It made sense to do that match in Jacksonville. It's a very Florida Championship Wrestling kind of match, even though there's a lot of modern ECW, postmodern hardcore elements in there. I thought it was a really well-constructed match. The fans were on the edge of their seat the entire time. And I think it blew past everybody's expectations of what this fight and what this match was going to be. I thought it was a great time, and it was a great, breaker for rampage having that in there in a one hour show having that kind of long multi-segment blood feud match in there because you see a lot of just kind of bucket matches where they kind of just fit segments which isn't a bad thing but i think having those matches to establish tone heading into 2022 is a great thing no absolutely i i thought i thought they did a good job at, at shining the talent there who stuck out to you the most out of out of all you know the the participants in the match i I know for like for example, I've seen Penelope wrestle numerous times in the Northeast. I think a lot of people haven't seen that she she's been able she's capable of these things. Yeah, I think that she put on a great performance, but if you're looking at it from a produ producerial way, I have to give the MVP of that match to the bunny. Because with she used blood the way you're supposed to in reaction in over the top, in drawing the story, in trying to create this crescendo, to create this vivid imagery. Andrew, you know this better than everybody, anybody outside of maybe me and like five other people. The wrestling magazines in the 70s, every single cover had somebody bleeding on it. Oh, uh, dude, and I tell the story the all the time. Tell that story all the time. What made me fall in love with wrestling, I want to say it was either 89 or 90. We're driving down to Florida. We stopped somewhere in Virginia. Every summer we would do this. And it was, we walked into the gas station and I saw, and I can't remember what, it was probably, uh, I, I don't know what magazine it was, but it was flare on the cover, covered head to toe in blood. And on, on, like next to him was Hogan, being Hogan, and it said, who would win? That's probably a wrestling eye. Or it was like probably, that's... yeah, it probably was. It probably was. A, uh, but to me, I stopped and I wa looked at it and I said, yeah. Who is this old man covered him? L little did I know, Flair was 40 <laughs> years old at that point. And I always make that point. 1992, he wins the WWE title in that Royal Rumble. Nobody, I'm watching that thing as a kid. And I'm thinking this old man is going gonna, is gonna to pass away in this match. He can't breathe. Bobby Heenan's selling it. He can get, someone get this man a ventilator. Someone get this man an oxygen mask. Screaming. And what does Flair do? He does the Flair flop and just, just crashes and burns right in the middle of the ring. Fantastic as a kid. Yeah. And you look at what all four wrestlers did in that match. It really set the stage for a really big 2022 for that women's division. Yeah. You see with the TBS title finale on Wednesday night and all the things they're doing to build to Battle of the Belts, which is just, it's a week from now. It's a week from yesterday, which is insane to me. Like all of this stuff is coming up really fast across the industry. Like we just had our first uh, premiere event plus uh, dynamic event thingamajig uh whatever's on the pnl sheet uh 
last night. A premium live we event? A premium live event. Premium live event, yes. Thank you. you I, be I believe that comes with a bottle and six sparklers. You can't hold me to that. <laughs> uh, but, like, talking about that match last night, you were talking about yeah. in your last segment, Brock Lesnar, in that match, established why he is the top guy in all of professional wrestling. You know, Him and Roman Reigns are the really 1A, are. 1B. And it's not a it's not a slight on anybody, but from when they announced Brock was in the match, you saw the reaction of the people in the audience. They popped for it. From when Brock was out, when he came out, to when he walked to the back, he was the most popular human on planet Earth within that universe, within that vacuum, for those twelve minutes. And I'm yeah, including entrance. And exit. Yeah, twelve, uh, barely twelve minutes with the entrances. I'm being but, kind. I'm but being you know generous. what? You're absolutely right. And and, and sometimes we got to look at it this way, right? Like. To me, who who's you ask ninety who's the best wrestler in the world right now, right? You ask that to our audience right now watching or listening to this. They're listening on Sports Byline, they're listening everywhere that we're syndicated, Twitch, uh, YouTube. You're gonna get a pretty interesting response. You're gonna get, you know, the Kenny Omegas, the Danielsons, uh Shingo Taga Takagi. You're gonna get Will Ospreay. You know these are these are names that we are familiar with. But you ask the casual viewer, you're gonna get two, maybe three, four responses, and mo most of those responses are gonna be Brock Lesnar, and it's gonna be Roman Reigns, top to bottom. So WWE knows what's going on here. They they see the data. They see how this is working. There's a reason why Brock Lesnar is constantly. In that top, top, top tier positioning, and it has to do with revenue that they're generating, uh, their their audience, their casual audience, and and what they stop at. You know, when you're channel surfing, that's a big indicator on how over somebody's getting, and they're able to tell, man, when Brock is on, when Roman's on, they could tell those things. Now, this again, this is not a knock at AEW whatsoever. AEW is a new company; it takes you a long time to develop a talent like a Brock Lesnar. And and do you when you've been right under yeah. them, though, I, I don't mean to cut you off. It's Brian no, Daniels. Man. It's Brian Danielson. Uh, it, it, listen to me. To me, it, I, if I were to, if I was going to give an award out, I know Dave does it. Does his you know <laughs> the awards? Uh, I would. To me, Danielson's my favorite wrestler in the world right now. And I, in my opinion, I think he's been. Uh, he's if if I had to tell you right now, best wrestler in the world, I would say Danielson. His performance over the last you know X amount of months, I would say from the beginning of the year to now, he's he has not had a bad match. He's made everybody look good that he's been working with. Uh, that's to me my favorite wrestler right now. And it's that Rolling Stones quality because yeah. they know how to play the hits, but they know how to be malleable because the Brian Danielson we're seeing now is not the one we saw at any point in the WWE, even when he was doing the full eco belt thing. This is the yeah. Brian Danielson we saw in Ring of Honor. This is the Brian Danielson that had the eye patch that was fighting uh, Morishima that was being the biggest jerk in the history of professional wrestling leading up to his match with Homicide. Like speaking of homicide, yeah. you can see him and Trevor Murdoch on uh, January fifteenth at Ewing. Uh, always uh, tinyurl. a carny com promoter. Slash Ewing NYC. See here, he heard the music uh. and he had to get that plug in. Guys, I, I have a ton, ton to talk about with Matt actually, and we're going to talk about the state of the Indies when we get back. Wrestling Observer Live. Andrew Zarin will be right back after this. Wrestling Observer Live. Andrew Zarian here, joined by Matt Ryan, executive producer. Catalyst Wrestling. Oh, hi. On, man. Hey, good to Nothing have you. Nothing much. Here. I was just jamming to that crazy town, making me remember when wrestling was on B-Cat and <laughs> all the Wild West days of independent wrestling. Yeah, it might, might remind you of your uh, broadcasting days of uh, being here in North Northeast working in radio. Ugh. <laughs> ah, no, never again. <laughs> never I did again. my time. I went from that to wrestling. Just, I'm here now. Don't take me back there. <laughs> I'm going to take you back. We're going back 20 oh. years. Going to ruin oh, your life oh. all over again. Uh, we were talking oh. about, we were talking about a uh, good transition here. We were talking about Danielson right before the break and what a standout year he's had. And, and you know, I, first time I saw him was probably Ring of Honor and Independence sometime 2004-ish. I probably was, was then. I probably saw him at the Hammerstein. Uh... 2004, 2006, something like that. I can't, I can't remember. 2006 was when Ring of Honor first went to the Manhattan Center. I was at that show. My first ever independent show, second ever independent show. 
The first one was at John Dewey Middle School in Sunset Park, Brooklyn in the mid-90s. Someone came out to Steve Austin's Hollywood Blondes music. Not Hollywood Blondes, when he was stunning Steve Austin, when Colonel Parker managed him. And I was marking out. I ran oh around God. hoping it was stunning Steve Austin. It was not. I left with the building with a piece of bloody kendo stick that my mother made me throw out. That is why I don't talk to my mom. That's not the reason. Well, she's dead. But besides that. Uh, that does, besides <laughs> that, I mean, that's a good reason. <laughs> uh, since you're talking about, since you're talking about uh, the Manhattan Center, the Hammerstein Ballroom, GCW is putting on a show here in a couple of weeks. And yeah. what do we get the other night? J E double F J A double R E double T made his surprise appearance, his GCW debut. First of all, this is the greatest thing, right? Jeff Jarrett is hysterical to me. His entirety of, of, of everything he does is hysterical to me. I was a big Jeff Jarrett fan as a kid. Loved the guitar gimmick. I love that he walked around hitting people with a gimmicked up guitar. He shows up dressed like The Undertaker. He attacked Effie out of all people with the guitar. And I think they've set up some sort of match for the Hammerstein with Jeff yep. Jarrett and F. What is happening in wrestling? What is happening? The, ti- the timeline's broken, dude. The like, timeline is once, broken. Once 2020 hit, none of, we're bringing in the NWA World Heavyweight Champion. I'm not even plugging, but like the, the last time an NWA champion was in Brooklyn in general was 1961 and it was Bruno versus Buddy Rogers. So let's talk about this. This is pretty cool, right? Yeah. Uh, Catalyst Wrestling, you're running New York. Uh, second show ever for you in New York. Yep. Uh, you normally run in Jersey. Uh, and you, you've been pretty successful running those shows in Jersey, but I think it's time. I think you're right. I think it's time to come to come to New York, come to, you know, New York City. You're running a show in Brooklyn. Uh, big yep. show for you, obviously. Congratulations. This, this is, uh, you know, a coming of age moment for Catalyst Wrestling. But I wanted to talk to you about, before we get in the fact that you have the NWA's, NWA's World Heavyweight Champion uh, being on that show. Obviously, you have Homicide, you have uh, Kobe Carino, which I'm a big fan of, by the way. Uh, you know, you, 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 always, you, you always put on a fantastic show with, with some great talent. But, you know, independent wrestling the last two years took a big hit, right? Yeah. Big, big hit. Uh, we also saw number, a number of companies like Evolve. I was a big Evolve show. I know that they weren't super indie considering they were on, you know, being supported by a larger company and they had some talent trades. But my God, you know, you want to walk into a nightclub on Northern Boulevard in Queens and, and, and pound down a six pack while watching some really, I mean, fantastic pro wrestling. There's no better. There's no better show than what Evolve was doing. Uh, it was it was great. I, I mean, you had talent like Matt Riddle. Uh, on those shows weekly, uh, you know, as as every six weeks or so when they ran it, right? Uh, they, they, Matt Riddle, Gargano, Ciampa, Ricochet. I mean, the list goes on and on of, of top tier talent that's been involved. But right now, those guys, obviously, WWE acquired a lot of those guys. AEW took a lot of those guys. Japan took a lot of those guys. That now they can't work. So, wh- what is, in your opinion, in your honest opinion, the state of independent wrestling? Not great right now, right? Or, or maybe it's fantastic with the abundant amount of free agencies happening. See, it's. I think this is the end of a cycle that began when Gabe got fired from Ring of Honor. Because then we saw super indies in terms of competition. Like early 2000s, like late 2000s, late aughts, early 2010s. We saw PWG really rise in notoriety, become a national and international product. We saw Ring of Honor grow with HDNet and then the eventual sell to Sinclair. We saw Impact go through all the different permutations it's gone through. We had Wrestlelicious at some point. let us I need someone to break that whole thing down at some <laughs> point. But when you're looking at independent wrestling now, yeah, it, it's a great time when you have the ability and you have the access like you take a look at the way that the market is open now gcw has hustled like what brett joey john carlo the entire team at gcw have been able to do since the spawn of the pandemic since march of 2020 has been an unescapable thing they have been able to do the things that no one's really been able to do since ecw generate a natural buzz create some sort of weird harmony between major companies and large scale independents like them and also provide a alternative. And I think that's what, at least coming from my point of view, that's what every independent company wants to be. They want to be an alternative. They want to provide something that's not seen in the industry. Like at Catalyst Wrestling, we're the only half hour 
independent wrestling show that airs nationally and internationally. We have a half hour of episodic programming a week. It's the shortest block of programming in any televised wrestling program. And I think that that's a great thing for the consumer because you get one match, you get one story to focus on, and it allows you to revolve into the next week and it allows you to build and get more interest and it creates a bingeable product. GCW is a bingeable product because there's always something going on and there's always a thread and there's always talent. And they've been able to pull off of these viral sensations, these viral performers like Effie and now Jeff feuding with Jeff Jarrett, Joey Janela and Scotty too hottie. They're able to do the right things. It's kind of like early UFC in a way where you're like, I just want to see what these matchups are. I want to see because they're nuts, right? They're crazy. And listen, Matt Cardona, uh, kudos to him, man. You know, you got to give him so much credit. He's the MVP. Uh, He deserves the observer award for this year. I, I, I think he deserves it because you take a look at it. No one's been able to shape the discourse of pro wrestling outside of the two major companies outside of Matt Cardona. He's created, whether people like it or not, a real an industry for ex WWE performers, yeah. for ex impact wrestling perform. Like you see how ring of honor ended with EC three and you saw the ex Braun Strowman, uh, I believe he's going by Titan now on the independents come in and you're seeing like that second act, that second life where you saw the, the ruthless aggression guys really didn't get that opportunity. They hey, really didn't get me, that chance me, to reinvent themselves. I'm getting mess. Like I, I, I can't begin to tell you how many messages I'm getting right now. Where can people, you, you said, obviously you're, you're all over the place with catalyst wrestling. Where can people watch catalyst wrestling? You can watch Catalyst Wrestling on YouTube for absolutely free. You can subscribe right now. Catalyst Wrestling on YouTube. Just search it in the search bar. We are also on Tubi. Back episodes on Tubi and also on Vudu. We are on Fox and Walmart owned properties. That just surprises me. To this I, sh- I should know this uh, actually. I should know yes. where, where Catalyst you Wrestling sh- is there. You, there's many reasons why you of all people should know this. Yeah. Um, but we are also on the Fight Network. Uh, in the U.S. and in Canada. You could check local listings for that. We're also on the new Dumont Network in Houston. We're on KVVB in uh, right outside of L.A. in uh, California, Victorville, California. Uh, we're also in negotiations with TV stations in Memphis and in uh, Minnesota in the St. Paul Twin Cities area. We're hoping to bring that there. We're also... Our, our first ever DVD from Skankfest in 2019 at Brooklyn Bazaar, a sold-out Brooklyn Bazaar. Uh, featuring Colby Carino on the card, Colossal Mike Law, Homicide, his first match in Brooklyn. Uh, I believe this was prior to his 25th anniversary show with GCW. You can buy that via Best Buy, Walmart, and more. You can go to our link tree, which is in our bio. You can follow us on Twitter. You can get that information there, at Catalyst Wrestle, across all social platforms. Thank you. As as the, the, the promoter genes in you. Uh, come out. And also, we're on gas. We're there, also there on go, gas you. digital. You can watch you us go. Saturday mornings at 11 a.m. on gas digital. Perfect. There you go. So, listen, you you brought up a lot of great points here, right? But like GCW, great example. Um, they the, the year that they've had. Obviously, I we've known GCW over all the independent events that they were doing. They've been doing some great stuff for a long time. But do you think the the I guess boxing them in to this hardcore style? is a detriment to them or do you think they're, they, they're smart enough to evolve beyond that if they want to get more of a, a national exposure I think they've evolved past it honestly like they use the hardcore stuff like their main event last night was alex cologne versus john wayne murdoch for their deathmatch title but if you look at all the other things that go on in gcw as i nonchalantly do the mr perfect with my hair uh you have all of these other storylines going on and all these other different things. And it kind of shows how GCW's evolved from being the deathmatch fed. And you see other companies like ICW, No Holds Bar, take more, more of center stage in regards to deathmatches and deathmatch wrestling. GCW uses it as a part of everything. Like it's, it's on the menu. It's, I believe GCW is a tasting menu of everything you would want to see in independent wrestling. You know, Which I, is a huge luxury for for a lot of people. Like they they've created something really special, and they've been able to build it out. You know, yeah, I, we have a couple minutes here uh, in the segment, but I wanted to, I, I definitely wanted to touch on this with with the rec- recent releases from WWE. Uh, Eighty some odd releases this year. I think it's a total over a hundred and something right now over the last uh, almost two years here. Also, uh, latest news: Tony Storm was allowed to leave. I believe she asked for her release, and they gave her her release. Where, 
if there was, I know it's crazy, right? Because two years ago, a little over two years ago, we we just got a, a, a competitor to w, yeah. a, a nationally a nationally televised competitor. Whether or not you consider them a real competitor, that's not that's not the point. The point is there is competition on the air. There is a national product that looks like an A plus product on television, competing for your eyeballs. Now I'm going to say something else. If there was ever a moment for a third company to come about. Isn't this the moment? Isn't this the time? Yeah. If if someone texted me after the show and said, I have $10 million for you to run a wrestling company. <laughs> you know what I, I would, would say? That's not I, enough, pal. <laughs> yeah, need, oh, no, it's not enough. More. But it's a good starting point. Trust me. Like, if if we if you had the opportunity right now to create a solid third alternative, the, it's the the opportunity is Matt, there. It's just but, all about what the delivery system. Matt, here, where, here's where the thing. are you going to air it? I don't think we've ever had this happen before. Where you look at you look at the availability of talent, and I don't think we've ever been in a moment where we've had you know a hundred, let's say a hundred or so independent free agent talent, pro wrestlers available. That now you can you, you got to pick. You you can't even just say like, oh well, I want I want the best of the best. No, you now you got to like. You got to look at this list and say where did where did these people fall? I don't think we've ever had this many availabilities, and it, it says something about the industry where you know WWE bloated up to the point that now they now they've released all these people for free agency, and there's nobody to take them because Tony can't sign all these guys, and rightfully so, no. he shouldn't. He shouldn't be. He has plenty of. He has plenty of talent on, on, on hand that he needs to grow himself. Wanna, and he's done a great job. You want to know my hot take? Yeah, give me give me a fast before the break. We've re we've reversed engineered the return of the territories. Yeah. Because of the bloat, because of that, we've reversed engineered the, the territories again because you're seeing different companies in different parts of the country or just going to different parts of the country and providing different styles of wrestling. And we're seeing different styles of wrestling come out of it. And I think it's going to be for a healthier business overall. I think there's going to yeah. be there's going to be a bit of a recession at some point. I don't know when it's going to be, but I think with all this talent we're going to see a hopefully, lot of renaissance. A, a hopefully renaissance, not yeah. soon. We're going to go to break. Uh, we'll no. be back right after this. Andrew Zarian here Wrestling Observer Live Sunday edition. Stay tuned. Andrew Zarian here Wrestling Observer Live Sunday edition wrapping it up here. Man, the fastest hour in pro wrestling radio. That's what I'm going to call it. That's what I'm going to say. This is like the fastest hour. I can't believe it's over. Mm. Matt Ryan here with us. Uh, Matt, you're running a show in Brooklyn. Tell us where they can find you. Yes. You can find us. Catalyst Wrestling returns to New York City for the first time since early 2020 pre-pandemic. We are at The Muse in Brooklyn. A bunch of carnies are taking over a carnival space, a shoot clown space, <laughs> on really January is. 15th in Bushwick at 350 Moffat Street, right off the L train. We are going to have, if the state allows, food and booze for you. And also, we're going to have the Catalyst Wrestling champion Darius Carter put up his title for the first time against Ring of Honor pure champion Josh Woods. We're going to have the NWA World heavyweight champion Trevor Murdoch come into team with Homicide as Homicide returns home to Brooklyn to battle Colby Carino and Wrecking Ball Ligurski, both of them from the NWA. We're going to have the return of Philly's Most Wanted, and we're going to hear a little bit more about that if you follow us on Twitter at Catalyst Wrestle. If you want to buy tickets starting at $25, they are at tinyurl.com slash ewingnyc or you can go to CatalystWrestling.com. Also, download the Rizzle app. Rizzle is the exclusive tech partner of Catalyst Wrestling. We are on there absolutely free with highlights, clips, and exclusive interviews. You want to do that now, download the Rizzle app and buy your tickets now for Ewing. That's right, we named the show after Patrick Ewing because we're in New York, baby, at CatalystWrestling.com or tinyurl.com slash EwingNYC. Listen, next time I expect it to be called Zarian. <laughs> After all the tickets you're going to sell honey, from gotta, this, like I'll, this. I'll name the show Dave. I'll name the show Brian. The Melty. I'll yeah, name it. <laughs> everything I'll, except I'll name me. it after the potato guy. I like, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll go deep with it. Everything. Call it Damien Demento eating a sandwich. Damien Demento eating a sandwich. Listen, I got a Damien Demento painting here in my studio. Guys, uh, definitely check it out. Catalyst Wrestling. We're out of time here. Andrew Zarian. You can follow me on Twitter. Wrestling Observer Live. We'll be back next week with a whole ton of wrestling. See you all next time, guys. Take care.